Hello and welcome to the India Hangout as we begin this exciting week. The markets are poised, the stock markets I mean, are poised in a very, very exciting phase right now. Uh, the Sensex is over 26,000 now, 26,800 to be specific. The Nifty more importantly has crossed the 8,000 mark and that of course begs the other question, are the stock markets heading to new territory which we've never seen before? The Sensex could uh, well hit 30,000 and the Nifty could well hit 10,000 and these are some of those psychological and non-psychological points that people are waiting for. Well, I'm going to talk about uh, what this means for the markets and if we are indeed racing to these new targets, uh, what could that mean for you as investors? Well, I'm joined by Sandeep Sabarwal of AskSandeepSabarwal.com. Uh, uh, I'm also joined by Anand Tandran, analyst from Hyderabad, the market guy. Uh, Sanju Verma, CEO of Violet Arc and Ramesh Damani, stockbroker, Bombay Stock Exchange. So, Sandeep, let me begin with you quickly. So, uh, what's happening here? I think the Indian market's uh, performance has been driven by two individuals. Mm -hmm. The first individual was Aguram Rajan, mm -hmm. who set uh, the forex uh, scenario in place, right. who set the entire external uh, environment in place. Right. And it's been exactly one year since he took over. Right. And uh, we are up around 73% in dollar terms mm -hmm. from for the Nifty mm. till uh, as on today. Mm. So I think uh, that's one guy which who came in and transformed uh, the outlook for India. Mm. The second was obviously Narendra Modi. Mm. So I think once he's come through, I think there's a huge, uh, uh, huge, huge, huge buildup of euphoria. There's a lot of hope mm. that the government will perform. Mm. And on-ground performance seems to be starting off, mm. but maybe not at the pace at which people expected. Mm. But I think it's starting. Mm. And I think the kind of deceleration the economy saw mm. over the last five, six years, it mm. takes some time for it to get up and start running again. Right, exactly. So you're saying that things have changed but not as much as to perhaps warrant the kind of euphoria or optimism that we're seeing. Yeah. So we're feeling good about things. True. Right? So Anand, let me come to you. How are you seeing this? I mean, you know, the question really is now, are we reaching the end of the runway? I mean, even before lift off? Well, it will largely depend on the running. I would rather focus on that than any of the other parameters. I think the fact is that yearning for the first time this Quarter have shown some kind of uptick, otherwise, we've had a fairly serious down drift for very long. And uh, there is, of course, the estimate going up already. The analysts have become a lot more bullish than perhaps the corporate have. But so long as the earnings uh, start to move up from here rather than stay flat or go down, uh, I think the market will obviously have a uh, lot more side to go. But that said, I think you know, the uh, expectations, as you mentioned, are slightly ahead of themselves at this and we are ignoring a lot of issues in the global market, which also I think they're watching. But that should not deter anyone from taking a slightly longer view on the market. And the Sorry, let me come back to you. So, you know, uh, markets obviously comprise companies or stocks of companies. Now, how is that performing? Now, I know companies are doing well. Uh, profits are still looking good. Uh, is it strong enough to again uh, fundamentally back the kind of optimism we're seeing in the secondary markets? I think we have to look at it two ways. Mm. One was that uh, the markets were hugely oversold, mm. most of the emerging markets beginning mm. of this year. Mm. So I think as the euphoria took over and, and as the fund flow started in mm. a big way, we've seen, we always tend to see markets either overshoot on the upside mm. and on the downside also we see them undershoot. Mm. So once the momentum starts, it's very, it's very difficult to predict where exactly it will stop. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one facet of it. Mm. Second is that I believe the market seem to be slightly overextended at this point of time. Mm -hmm. One, because I don't think the industrial growth uh, uptick mm. will happen so fast what mm. people are expecting. Mm. Secondly, agriculture growth has taken a hit because of erratic monsoons. Mm. So we'll see some sort of hit on GDP in the third quarter because mm. of that. Mm. And thirdly, the global scenario is not looking very exciting. Mm. I think there are huge uh, geopolitical issues which are playing out now. Yeah. And most global markets, mm. uh, especially the Western ones, seem to be poised for a second round of correction. Mm -hmm. So in the first round of correction, the emerging markets held on. But what we've seen in the past that typically financial markets tend to be linked in the short run. So my view is that we could see another sell-off come through. Mm -hmm. And that will, uh, so which could take the markets down to maybe 7,100, 200 mm. odd levels, mm. which is the 16th May level when the election results came. Right. And that will set the base for a further up move. Right. So if I were to ask you to divide the two factors, right, the external and the internal. The internal, of course, we've spoken of. The external, we've touched upon. How much uh, weightage would you give to these factors as they are driving what we see today? I think the correction 
will be driven by external factors okay. largely. Mm. And the positivity which is getting mm. built up is more due to domestic factors. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about the market at 30,000, mm -hmm. I would say that in 2015, we could see 35,000 also. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't rule that out. Okay. And uh, because beginning of this year, my view was that we will get to 7,700 for the Nifty mm. and around 27,000 for the Sensex, right. which has come through. Right. And from next year actually will be very good for the mm. markets okay. because that will be the time the government would have set its uh, things right. into place. Okay, so we'll come to next year and how things are going to look ahead in a moment. But uh, Ramesh Damani joins us. Ramesh, so what I'm trying to understand as we lay the foundation for what could lie ahead is to first understand what has really happened when we look back at, at this rise that has happened. So walk us through what you saw or how you saw the market sort of gallop in the manner it did in the last uh, year or so. Sure, uh, thank you very much for inviting me on your show. You know, someone a few days ago asked me to paraphrase uh, what had happened in the last year in India. And I think I quoted Ronald Reagan by saying that it's morning in India. And I think what has happened over the last year, if you remember exactly about a year ago, the rupee was in deep free fall. And there was almost uh, white eyed panic in the stock market. And the market has seen a stunning rally from that. And I think what that teaches us is that uh, the worst was priced into the market a year ago. The market then started looking at a recovery ahead, a new election, a new government, interest rates coming down, inflation cooling off, and a new bull market, which we now, I think, almost unanimously call the Narendra Modi bull market began. And uh, that took us up to May, when we actually won the election or sworn in. And after that, I believe the second phase of the bull market starts, which is typically a very long and productive phase in the market. So I think uh, if you put that in, in, in context, we are, uh, you know, Within one year of a new bull market having begun, the index is already flying 40-50% in the time trail. But the good news is that the year ahead looks uh, still more promising. I think uh, this bull market probably has a lot of points and a lot of time in terms of years to go. Right. Okay, so we've got questions coming in as well. Uh, Shruti Malhotra asks, uh, has the economy moved at the same pace as the markets? Question marks. She seems to answer it as well. No question mark. So is this a rally of hope? Sandeep? Markets always tend to judge what's going to happen in the economy mm. much before all of us do individually. Mm. So when the market fell off in the year 2008, mm -hmm. the economy was still growing at 9% and it continued to grow at 8 to 9% over the next two years. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we should judge the market mm. in that manner. Mm. Because the way to judge it is what's the future going to be. Mm. Because stock markets don't uh, move on past data. Mm. So the data we saw yesterday mm. of 5.7% growth mm. is irrelevant as far as the market is concerned mm. for what it will do in the future. Mm. It's more important for the market what 2015 will be, 16 will sure. be, 17 will sure. be. And to that extent, the, out, the longer term outlook for Indian markets mm. is becoming better and better. Mm. Although we might have short term concerns. So, uh, you know, so the markets are good, doing well, they will continue to do well, optimism about 2014-15. Is, uh, is there a sort of one-to-one -one correlation between the way the companies are expected to perform uh, and the way the market is expected to perform? No, actually it's not how the companies will perform and that has a bearing on the markets. Mm. It's how the market thinks the companies will perform. Sure, yeah, yeah. So I think it's more perception than reality mm. in the markets. Mm -hmm. And if reality turns out to be as good as perception, mm. then markets hold on. Mm. If it's better than perception, market go even higher. Yeah. If it's worse than perception, then we get uh, what we saw in previous corrections. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we have to look at markets. So mm -hmm. people shouldn't see a single month figure or a mm -hmm. single quarter figure and try mm -hmm. to judge. Mm -hmm. Because I think the way the new government is working mm -hmm. and the way their long term plans are building up, mm -hmm. I think we are in for a stronger run for se for a long time. Mm. So people who have missed the rally markets up 70% in dollar terms or 55% in rupee terms over the last one year. Mm. So obviously it will correct. Mm. So people can wait, come in at that stage. Right. So I think that's how people should look at the market. Right. So yeah, another question uh, which I'm going to put to both of you. Anand, let me put this one to you first. Uh, uh, is this a retail uh, investors rally? It seems like a lot of euphoria without substance. What are the real market levels? I don't think that that question has an answer. There is nothing like a real market here. At the end of the day, it is a question of what is the alternative investment opportunity that uh, uh, that fund has, whether individual or or uh, you know, as a fund house. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that if you are a domestic investor, then you've pretty much been shut out of the debt market by the uh, recent change in the tax law. Yeah. And uh, you know, given that uh, property rates are far higher than uh, 
uh, perhaps the asset values would determine you have pretty much nothing left except to invest in equity. So, uh, and with that, of course, you have the added advantage that right now the market, at least on a historic basis, is not looking very expensive. Uh, that said, many of the companies have moved up and far too rapidly. So, uh, you know, there would there should be a, a kind of pause and perhaps an opportunity for people to get back in. But on the other hand, if you have a long enough view, then you don't need to bother about every two million. Right, right. So uh, that's I guess one way of looking at it, Sandeep. Uh, show, how do how do retail investors who are obviously not there in this market mm -hmm. how do they view this phenomenon? I think retail investors have been skeptical about the markets, and retail investors are more driven by the sentiments mm -hmm. or how they see their own lives being. Mm -hmm. So if they themselves start feeling better, if mm -hmm. their jobs are giving them better returns, mm -hmm. or if they are earning more, mm -hmm. then they'll feel more like investing into equities. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would rather be secure. So in mm -hmm. India, given mm -hmm. a option of investing in FD mm. or equity, people will always go for a fixed deposit. Mm. So that's the normal psychology. So mm. equity has traditionally been a push product. Mm. And let's see, if this time the markets do well, economy does well long enough, mm. then it might actually become a pull product. Mm. So we saw it becoming a pull product for a short time to in 2006 seven yes. but that didn't last too long. Yeah. So let's see how it goes going forward. So I mean, for instance, some people believe that 10,000 is the trigger point where you will start seeing more people being attracted to the markets. No, I think uh, already participation has gone up substantially. Yeah, yeah. We see if we see mutual fund flows, mm. mutual fund flows over the last yeah. three months since and the election has actually gone up. Yeah. Actually gone up. Yeah. And I think it'll keep on building up. Right. So I think now that the flow has started, mm. it'll keep on building up for the next three, four years. I don't see it stopping. OK. So uh, Ramesh, uh, let me put this question to you with a uh, with a twist. Uh, so how much steam do you think this rally has, uh, number one? And secondly, uh, you know, th one way of looking at it is that there isn't that much underlying change in the fundamentals, economic and corporate, to support the kind of optimism. And therefore, uh, should we be uh, a little concerned? That's not quite true. I mean, uh, typically, Govind, is, you're, of course, also well aware that bull markets climb the walls of worry. And typically when a bull market starts, the headlines are extremely negative, as was evidence a year ago when the rupee was depreciating, inflation was high, and the government seemed to be stuck in a policy paralysis. Now all that is already beginning to change. The rupee is stable, inflation is coming down, and uh, of course the policy paralysis uh, we so famously called is now seeming more like policy movement going on. So I think the headlines will start turning negative. Typically it takes a year before the headlines start turning positive. And I think uh, we will build on the gains. Uh, there might not be spectacular big bang type of reforms that maybe the market hopes for. But then incrementally, we are seeing a good positive change on the ground. So uh, Sandeep, let me come back. There are more questions for you. Uh, you seem to be saying that markets can predict everything, the economy, the companies. Uh, hasn't the market got it wrong? Yeah, markets got it wrong many times. Many times. Yeah. So I think 2008 was a perfect example of that, mm -hmm. where the markets got it wrong big time. Mm. So I think markets can get it wrong, but not at the initial stages of a bull market. Mm -hmm. So this is a bull market in, for India as well as a lot of emerging markets which is just starting again. Mm. Unlike the developed markets which have had a continuous bull market for the last almost five to six years. Mm. So I don't think people should be trying to second guess at this stage today. Mm. Mm. Maybe three years down the line when mm. there is huge euphoria, when mm. everyone believes that markets cannot fall at all. Mm. That will be the time to pose this question. Okay. So you're saying as you did, as you said a little while ago that we are at a position where we could even slide back and perhaps there may be a need to do so. Yeah. So there's a high probability because mm. of the pace of the market move mm. and the way it's moved up. Okay. And the kind of foreign fund flows we've seen, $30 mm. billion dollars come in on this year already. Mm. So that we might see some pullback as mm. global concerns play out. Mm -hmm. But I think that will be more an opportunity for investors to come in. Mm. So I would say that for investors who are out, mm. stay out for some time okay. because you haven't come in till now. Yeah. For those who are in, mm. they shouldn't try to trade too much. Right. Okay. So uh, Anand, between, I was, I was posing this question somewhat differently to Sandeep earlier. How, would, how much weightage would you give to the external front and how much to the internal? And when I say external, I mean, I mean, the, the world is a troubled place right now. I mean, we've got uh, trouble in the Middle East, we've got trouble in uh, uh, Russia, Russia, Ukraine, uh, you know, I, I mean, and, and there is a general concern about, you know, something could, uh, you know, suddenly escalate uh, uh, without us uh, knowing or expecting or anticipating it. So to what extent should we be concerned about that? Or alternatively, to what, how strong are the is the domestic uh, uh, sentiment and pro, 
uh, which might actually counterbalance that. Well, you know, since the central banks have started to intervene in the global market and uh, in a coordinated manner, uh, you know, there is uh, the only fool is one who doesn't invest in them. Anyone who's cautious or who has uh, uh, tried to be prudent has actually turned out to be missing the rally. So there is a central bank put which has been uh, in place now for a long while. And it has encouraged rash investments uh, for many years now, and it seems to continue to do that. So at least as far as the equity markets are concerned, or for that matter, most of the asset markets, there seems to be a sort of blinker as to whatever is happening around the world, whether it is the fact that, for example, green Italy debt is now trading at the same yield as the German debt, uh, despite the fact that unemployment levels in Italy, for example, are higher than what they were in 2008, or the fact that the geopolitics around Ukraine and uh, Russia has uh, uh, significantly deteriorated. So uh, overall, from a global market point of view, I think the markets have gone up a bit, have uh, gone up a lot, and especially emerging markets of late have attracted a lot of ETF money. We're beginning to see uh, a little bit of that tapering off, and I think India has already become overweight in most uh, emerging markets. So, so I would not be very surprised at all to see that the fund flow here, at least in India, uh, were to begin to take paper off first from the overseas market and has a lag effect from the Indian market. And it is therefore very likely that what some week is forecasting, that there could be a, a bit of a sell-off, it should be quite possible. Uh, uh, Sandeep, let's go to the sort of what's going to happen in, in the next maybe six, six months to nine months. Uh, what's your sense? I mean, you know, so we've talked about the larger factors that could drive it one way or the other, but what could really happen, assuming uh, an optimistic uh, upward move and if things don't work the way we think it should work? I think over the next six to nine months, I think the bigger concern or the bigger risk, I think, is over the next two, three months. Mm -hmm. As the U.S. Fed scales back its asset purchases, mm. as there is more likelihood, and we know m much more when the interest rate hikes will start in the U.S. And as we know more about this entire Ukraine-Russia standoff, so I think that's a big risk, which the mar financial markets are totally ignoring. Mm. Because uh, what's going to happen in uh, with in this conflict mm. is it could be it could turn really ugly mm. before it turns better. Mm. So I think those are the reasons to be concerned in the short run. Mm -hmm. I think over the next six to nine months, this government which we have in India now, mm. they'll be much more in control. Mm -hmm. They'll be driving the economy much more. Mm. And to that extent, the domestic risk would have come down. Mm -hmm. So I think specifically from India, India would be a much better place to invest in in mm. 2015. Mm. But specific to the world, that's something which we'll have to watch we out for. Right. So, uh, Ramesh, uh, let me put the other question to you. So, uh, you know, we're, we've talked about the economy and the general sense that things are looking good. The government is in control, as Sandeep said. Uh, if the economy is good, are, are you, do you have the same underlying faith or the faith in the underlying companies and whether they are uh, equally poised to expand and grow? Almost certainly. I mean, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure who said it, but someone said that if, you do, if the government did nothing, India would grow at 4% because there's just so much latent demand in this economy. It was being suffocated due to inflation, infrastructure bottlenecks. I think slowly the government is trying to clean off uh, all those bottlenecks. So, you know, I think uh, we will be surprised by our own growth maybe two years down the road. I would not be shocked if you went back to, say, a 7.5% growth rate. If we are saying, Sandeep, that, you know, things are looking a little un uncertain for the next two or three months, suppose you want to take a, a forward look on the Indian economy, right? So what are the two factors that might work in favor for the, of the economy? Now I'm talking about a larger India effect. Let's, let's forget external for a moment, right? And let's forget also perhaps our confidence in the, in the government itself. What are the other one or two factors that we can depend on to take things up and the other way around? I think improving consumer sentiment mm -hmm. and a general feeling of uh, goodness which has come through mm -hmm. in India, mm -hmm. that will drive consumer demand. Mm -hmm. So the first signs of that we are seeing in auto sale numbers which mm -hmm. will come up for August. Mm -hmm and some of the durable numbers which we'll see coming out later. Mm. But the bigger, I think, issue will be driving the investment cycle, mm -hmm. which needs a lot of issues to be resolved. Mm. For example, when uh, the government took over and Mr. Gadkari took over as NHI, uh, as uh, surface mm. transport minister, mm. there was a huge expectation that within two, three, four months, mm. a lot of tenders will start Projects coming start through. Moving, yeah. But we don't see that happening as of mm. now because the issues well, are That's deeper. also a sign that the government is hitting roadblocks which 
any government would hate and perhaps they were being a little too optimistic. Yeah, so they thought they'll resolve it in yeah, X time, yeah. but that hasn't happened yeah. in X time. Yeah. It's not that it won't happen. Yeah. So, so it will come through. Mm. So I think people will need to be slightly patient to that extent. Mm. And those things where the markets run ahead of uh, fundamentals, then correct, consolidate, mm. and then move up again. I think that's how it will play out. Okay. And uh, uh, Anand, let me uh, let me come to you. So, if we are saying that the markets are looking good and we are indeed uh, moving towards that 10,000 and 30,000 mark, uh, what are the kind of sectors that you feel are likely to keep the momentum going? Are they different this time around, or are they likely to be different in coming months? Before I come to that, let me just add uh, one line to what the earlier answer that uh, Sandeep was saying. If you look at the sectors that uh, when I look for investment, other than things like infrastructure where there is obviously an issue of shortage of capital and back to long term debt, uh, which remains a problem. Uh, and so long as the banking sector remains uh, at the level of capitalization it is, I don't see how that's going to be solved very easily. No other industry I can think of has actually got a capacity constraint. You know, if power is operating at less than 70% PLF, uh, you know, any other sector you look at, whether it is truck manufacturer, whether it is cement. Uh, you name it, it is not operating anywhere near optimum capacity. Mm -hmm. So the question really I have is, which sector would require investment? And other than infrastructure, I don't see anything that requires investment. Infrastructure requires really long-term debt and very patient capital. I don't think that we are in the position to have either. I think the problems are a little more endemic and a lot more serious than what the market would tend to make it sound. That said, there is a lot of faith we have in the Indian entrepreneurs. Given a choice that there is a little bit of proactive government in the form of saying, look, if you have a problem, we try and solve it, rather than saying, if you have a problem, let's try and compound it, which is what we had for the last few years. Mm -hmm. There is a good chance that, you know, earnings will move up. So really, you are taking a bet on the fact that there is a cyclical movement. I don't think that it's going to be very easy to spot as to which sector will necessarily do well. If you look at what have been doing well, for example, in terms of earnings, they remain the external sector. So, you know, Arma has been doing exceedingly well. Uh, oil and gas, of course, has started to do well because the prices have been raised, but that is causes inflation. I don't see that being sorted out very soon. So we will have inflationary pressures in India continuing for a while, and therefore I think the external sector remains one of the areas which is very good. The fact that we had a strong depreciation last year, which uh, allowed all export-oriented units to do well or provide a uh, you know kind of protection against Chinese imports, is also a sector uh, are also sectors which will do well. So you know you continue to look at chemicals and some other smaller sectors like that. The rest of it to a large extent is open. Okay, uh, Sandeep, what's your sense? I mean, what 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 are you betting on broadly? Uh, which will I mean, betting on the stuff that will keep all of this going and uh, people smiling. I think uh, consumer-driven industries like automobiles. So I think they should mm -hmm. continue to do well, and, and that'll keep on. Uh, that'll help the markets. In terms of banks, I think private sector banks will still do well. Mm -hmm. And uh, public sector will banks will have their own issues because of this recent bribery scandal. There's a lot of scares, so I think there might be other issues which might come up out there. Uh, on the capital expenditure side, I think uh, contrary to what Anand was saying, my view is that the capex cycle has been subdued for so long mm. that even basic capex and all people cut down on a lot of things. Mm. So I think as the sentiment improves, mm. there will be some proactive investment which will also come through. Mm. So no, I, think I think the point he's making is that uh, uh, capacity is still to catch up with demand. That's think, true. Which is clear in all the core, at least the big sectors, like including automobiles. So what happens is that people lose faith mm. and then psychologically no one wants to invest. Mm. So as demand picks up, mm. people want to be ready for the next round of demand. Mm -hmm. So even though they might have capacities, mm. they'll still start investing. Right. So I think it's all a matter of... Uh, it's all a question of sentiment and how they see the future being. Mm. If they see it being subdued, they mm. will not invest. Mm. If they think it will be brighter, mm. they'll start investing. That's true. And perhaps if this is the time to start doing that, because in any case, by the time it goes on stream, at least for the steel, cement, and automobile and so on, it will be at least a couple of years. Yeah, or more. Yeah, or more. Uh, I don't know, Ramesh, if we've got you back. Uh, what, are, what are the two or three sectors you see uh, keeping all this going and uh, looking strong in coming months? You know, typically at this phase, the cyclicals will tend to do well. Uh, we've already had leadership in the market on tech, pharma, uh, FMCG, if you will. They had a sluggish period the last three months. They're now bouncing back very strongly. But if you want to look for a sunrise sector, something that people aren't exposed to, aren't aware of, I would suggest e-commerce. We're going to have 20 crore people in India having a smartphone in the next couple of years. And so there'll be huge demand for 
companies that understand marketing, say, in media, logistics, packaging, data, and, of course, the mainland companies will, are somewhat too rich for my valuation. But otherwise, there's lots of opportunities if you think that the e-commerce boom is just beginning in India and will, you know, one in five Indians will have a smartphone in the next two, three years. So, it, you know, it portends good uh, growth and good trends in that industry. You know, uh, the other thing is, as retail investors now perhaps decide whether they want to get in or not, and I think your answer is that they should stay out. Uh, but perhaps the temptation will only rise as the, as the market rises, and if indeed we are going towards those mar magical marks that we were talking about, what do they do then? See, there are two type of retail investors. One are who are actually investors. Second mm -hmm. are those are tra who are traders and mm -hmm. who say we are investors. Mm -hmm. So my advice to those kind of traders are, that you stay out. Mm. For investors who who are not bothered about what's happening tomorrow mm. and where they are more bothered about whether we'll create wealth over the next four, five, ten years. Mm. And they'll they should keep on coming in and they will keep on coming in. Mm. So I think once because being in the mutual fund industry for so long, I've mm. seen two cycles play out. Mm. So I think it always happens. Mm. Once the new high gets taken out, mm. once there's an improvement in sentiment, mm. the funds flow starts mm. and it will not stop now till the time when the next crash happens, mm -hmm. next big crash happens. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that... And you're uh, also saying it's almost inevitable in some ways, someday. In, yeah, so it's inevit okay. inevitable yeah. someday, but yeah. I think that day is very pretty long, okay. uh, pretty far far off okay. as of today. Okay. Anand, uh, last question. So how, how do you uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, what, what would you tell investors who are itching to get in at this point of time? Or might start Sorry. itching very soon, yeah. I think the simple answer is uh, find companies where your earnings growth is reasonably safe and where you're not taking too much. You know, you have a large choice of companies out there, so it shouldn't be difficult to find them, which meet the criteria that makes them comfortable. The second thing is that, you know, buy only stocks which you think you're going to be comfortable with. I have seen people make money on uh, stocks which are very boring by losing money on the exciting ones and vice versa, uh, depending on their own ability to get shaken out at the wrong time. So, you know, if you're comfortable with the business, then you can stick with it. If you're not, then it's not the question of what happens to the market. It's really the question of how you react. So, good businesses, things that you're comfortable with, and look beyond, you know, the next six months. Look for a two, three year cycle now, rather than the next. Arun, the, the, just to round the discussion up, the, when do you see the 30,000 mark being hit? Uh, I don't like to put a number on this, but, you know, it's only 10% away, so it's not as if it's a very long fall, uh, perhaps. Okay. You know, if the earnings grow at 15 to 20 percent and compounded over the next three years, it will happen sooner rather than Okay. Uh, Sandeep? I don't know when 30,000 will happen, yeah. but I think we'll get 35,000 next year. Okay. That's a nicer way to put it. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, we started by asking whether uh, we are racing towards the 30,000 mark for the Bombay Stock Exchange Sensex. Well, the answer seems to be yes, and uh, as you see, most uh, uh, market people are optimistic enough to actually project beyond that. And that's perhaps a sign of the sheer confidence in what's happening in the Indian economy and the companies within. That's all we have time for on this edition of the India Hangout. We're going to be back in time. Thanks for watching.